This week on the podcast, Israel launches attacks on Lebanon, and we talk to Rising Tide's Zach Schofield about building a mass climate movement. Kill us wherever you find us. Kill us under every stone and in every shrine and in every mosque. We will not abandon Palestine. Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the Green Left News podcast. My name's Isaac Nellis and I'll be your host today. Uh, I'm speaking to you from Gadigal land in Sydney, land that was never ceded and always was, always will be Aboriginal land. Green Left pledges to stand with First Nations people in campaigns for sovereignty, justice and land rights. And just before we start, I'd like to mention that uh, we are people-powered media with no corporate advertising or funding, so you can help us out massively by becoming a supporter at greenleft.org.au forward slash support. Plans start from $5 a month. You can also help us out by liking this uh, podcast or sharing it with your friends. And that makes a massive difference. So we've got uh, two main topics today. Um, later on the podcast, we're going to be joined by Zach Schofield from Rising Tide. Uh, Rising Tide are the group who organized the uh, People's Blockade of the World's Largest Coal Port last year in Mullabimba or Newcastle. And they're doing it again this year. So we're going to be talking to Zach about the latest uh, in the climate campaign and how we can resist um, some of the uh, terrible fossil fuel uh, expansion plans that are happening. But first of all, we're talking about Israel's attacks on uh, Lebanon. So uh, we're approaching the 12 month uh, mark of the uh, latest genocide uh, in Gaza with Israel's constant bombardments and attacks showing no sign of stopping. And as we've talked about many times on the podcast, uh, Western governments including Australia and the US, are fully backing Israel with arms, military intelligence, funding, political support, etc. And now Israel has escalated its war, launching devastating attacks on Lebanon. So there has been conflict. Uh, Israel has been launching attacks on Lebanon for this whole 12-month uh, period, with Hezbollah launching, uh, also launching attacks a against Israel. But you can see these charts online um, that I'll put on the video if you check if you're watching on the video that show the complete disparity between how many bombs have been dropped uh, on Lebanon and how many bombs have been sent uh, back from from Lebanon to Israel. It's, it's completely uh, uh, a completely different uh, kettle of fish. You can see huge, huge numbers of bombs being dropped on Lebanon. But this renewed offensive uh, began with an unprecedented terrorist attack from Israel against Hezbollah um, on September 18. They detonated thousands of pages and walkie-talkies that used to communicate uh, in Lebanon, and they killed about 40 people um, and wounded hundreds, uh, potentially thousands. So all these, these explosions of all these pages and devices took place in civilian areas, and lots of civilians died, including um, children. Then, just days later, carried out a bombing raid on Beirut that hit uh, Hezbollah targets and a school, including 30, uh, killing 37 people, including 13 children. So, um, since then, uh, Israel has launched hundreds of airstrikes on Lebanon. And they've killed almost uh, uh, killed more than a thousand people, including many children. Uh, they've wounded thousands more, and millions have been displaced. Um, over a million people have been displaced, which is almost a fifth of the population. The population of Lebanon is about five and a half million. They've bombarded uh, apartment blocks, ambulances, killed journalists, um, and a close associate of Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has said they want to make Lebanon look like Gaza. So that tells you exactly what their, their aims are here. We've all seen the terrible images of Gaza um, just being destroyed by Israeli bombs and attacks. Um, Israel's also killed the Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah in Beirut, uh, and they've also been launching attacks against Yemen, targeting power stations and seaports. Um, people will know that the Houthi uh, fighters in Yemen have been uh, blocking the Red Sea Canal and uh, targeting Israeli um, ships and, the, and ships that are supplying Isra Israel with goods as a part of resisting the genocide. So. Uh, this is all happening very quickly, and as, as I'm talking, as we're recording this, and by the time you're listening, a lot of the stats that I've mentioned will have gotten worse, um, and things could have changed quite drastically since uh, well, while you're listening to this. But as of now, um, Israel has reportedly launched a ground invasion of Lebanon. Well, it's actually interesting because 
Israel's announced that they've launched a ground invasion, but Hezbollah has said they actually haven't. So it's a bit unclear at this time what, what's happened. Um, but they've also continued their bombing strikes, destroying, you know, huge apartment blocks full of people, basically trying to clear the whole of south, south of Lebanon. Um, yeah, so at the time of recording, we, there's been reports that a small incursion of, of special forces troops has been sent in, but hasn't been fully confirmed. Uh, and it may be setting the stage for a, you know, a bigger full-scale ground invasion. Um, in response to this escalation of war against Lebanon, Iran has sent um, attack uh, missiles to attack Israel, uh, but they've claimed that none of the attacks have hit. Um, and the United States has made it very clear where its position lies by saying it will back Israel against any retaliation from Iran or others. So you see that the US is continuing to support um, Israel despite its attacks on Lebanon and Australia is falling in line with the US as well. So just for a bit of uh, kind of background, Israel is using a strategy that it, it uh, started using during its 2006 war on Lebanon, which is known as the Dahia Doctrine, which basically the idea is to uh, deter anyone, any, any country, any group, from attacking Israel by threatening to inflict high levels of violence on civilians or areas that are inhabited by civilians. So another word for that would be terrorism. So targeting civilians, inflicting violence, inflicting terror to achieve your political and military goals is pretty much the definition of terrorism. Um, and that's why, you know, uh, we at the rallies we're chanting that Israel is a terror state. Um, and that's clearly what they're doing here as well in Lebanon, targeting civilians. So uh, obviously we've had, you know, 12 months of rallies uh, against the uh, genocide in Gaza, uh, continuing weekly here in, in Gadigal, Sydney and in Nam, Melbourne, and also, you know, weekly, fortnightly, regularly in other cities across the country and all around the world. Uh, but there were also snap protests that took place after the attacks on Lebanon were launched, saying hands off Lebanon and demanding Israel stop uh, it's end its attacks. Also, obviously, calling on the Australian government to cut ties with Israel and stop supplying, uh, you know, weapons and funding and political support. The solidarity with Lebanon was also a major theme at last weekend's uh, uh, rallies on September 29 that were part of a national day of action organised by the Australia Palestine Advocacy Network to mark the 12 months of genocide. Um, so something that we saw out of that uh, was Labour and coalition politicians egged on by the establishment media attacking protesters for waving Hezbollah flags. Basically, they're claiming that it's against the law to wave flags of what they call a registered terrorist organisation. Um, and a lot of people have made the, the point that if terrorist flags of terrorist groups are banned, then people waving Israeli or US flags uh, should be banned because those uh, those they're the real terrorists um so particularly peter dutton has been calling for anyone who waved a hezbollah flag at the rallies to be deported or arrested um though he got a bit embarrassed when the federal police said that it's not an arrestable crime um to wave the flags um but they have been using this as a way to attack the palestine solidarity movement and and lebanon solidarity um there are big rallies planned for this weekend um which is uh, the, sixth, the 5th and 6th of October and the 7th of October, obviously, to mark the 12-month anniversary of the genocide. Um, and uh, there's been attempts to, to kind of crack down on protests and shut down these protests, particularly in Sydney, where New South Wales police are taking the Palestine Action Group um, to the Supreme Court to try and uh, call off the protest. Um, you know, which is kind of crazy when you consider that this, this is the 52nd week of protests in a row where there hasn't really been any incidents of violence from protesters, obviously has been from police. Um, and so there's no excuse, no reason why these protests can't go ahead. And hopefully, uh, you know, uh, I think thousands will still attend the protest. Could, uh, hopefully it's still one of the big protests um, to mark the 12 months of genocide. So. If you're listening to this before those protests have happened, it's more important than ever to attend the protests. We've got a lot of information about where they are, where they're happening on the Green Left website. As I said, October 6, big rallies in Gadigal, Sydney and Nam, Melbourne. And then I think it's the following week, uh, October 13th in 
McGange in Brisbane and there's uh, lots of other rallies. I won't mention them all, but uh, check out the Green Left Calendar. And there's also vigils, um, candlelight vigils on October 7th to mourn, you know, all the 40,000 plus people who have been killed in Gaza and the thousands killed in Lebanon already. So, you know, I guess looking at it on a bigger picture, it's why is Israel attacking Lebanon? Um, there's, there's plenty of reasons. I mean, Lebanon, uh, Israel has been attacking Lebanon for, for decades. So that's one aspect. There's also the fact that Hezbollah has been uh, uh, supporting um, Hamas in, in Gaza and trying to resist the genocide. Um, but there are people, some, some say that it kind of reeks of desperation, like uh, Netanyahu's under threat, let's launch another attack, where others would say it's a sign of confidence that, you know, they've gotten away with a year of war crimes, year of terror and murder in Gaza, um, with full support of, of Western countries like Australia and the US and many others. Um, so why not, you know, why not expand, expand that and attack Lebanon when they know that they're not going to get any serious... Uh, there's going to be no serious um, response from the US and, and other backers. So that's another element of it. Um, it's all changing very quickly at the moment, so it's hard to kind of cover it clearly in this podcast, but we'll definitely be continuing to report. I just wanted to mention another element was that the United Nations General Assembly um, uh, overwhelmingly adopted a resolution calling on Israel to end its illegal occupation of the Palestinian territories. And that motion passed 124 to 14 on September 18. So there were 43 countries that abstained, including Australia, um, which is you know pretty shameful. Uh, so what it shows is we need to keep building the Palestine solidarity movement here in, in our in this country um, and to force our government to stop supporting the genocidal apartheid state of Israel. So as I mentioned, we'll see you at the rallies this weekend, and next week on the podcast we'll talk about the 12 months of genocide, uh, the, the, the protests and rallies and vigils marking that 12 months and, you know, where, where things are at in the case of the attacks on Lebanon. So protests erupted across the country on September 25 when Environment Minister Tanya Plibersek approved the expansion of three thermal coal mines in northwestern New South Wales. And climate activists and organisations say these projects will supercharge climate change and lock in a huge amount of carbon emissions. So to discuss this disastrous decision and how people are resisting the expansion of fossil fuels, we're lucky to be joined by Rising Tide activist, Zach Schofield. Welcome to the podcast, Zach. Thanks very much for having me, Isaac. So what's your take on uh, Plibersek's decision to expand these coal mines and what impacts will they have on the climate? So these three massive coal expansions, um, I think account for up to 1.3 to 1.5 billion uh, tonnes of carbon emissions over the course of their expected lifetime. Um, that's a massive uh, impact. It's, uh, I think, not unprecedented, but certainly the largest expansion um, that has happened in New South Wales um, and under this current Labor government, for sure, it's the largest um, thermal coal expansion. And I want to be clear, this is not about keeping the lights on at home. Um, this is thermal coal for export. It's also not for making steel. It's not coking coal. It's thermal coal for export. And... Um, the only justification for, for any sort of expansion like this is to make the corporations more money um, in the dying days of the coal export industry. Um, so I'm from Newcastle. Uh, I've lived there all of my life. I'm now in Sydney, but Newcastle's really dear to me, and it is the world's largest coal port. So when exported, the coal will come out of Newcastle and likely go to uh, one of our major trading partners, China, uh, Japan, Korea, or Taiwan. And the CEO of the Port of Newcastle has actually said just a few months ago that he and industry leaders are expecting that the coal export market to these major trading partners will actually collapse within the next 10 years because all of these major industrial economies are either uh, transitioning to renewable energy or, in some cases, domestic production of coal. 
And that's really simply because they would rather uh, produce their own energy at home than buy it from us. Uh, it's pretty intuitive. <laughs> if you were an industrial economy, I'm sure you would do the same. And renewable energy um, is just taking over the world in terms of um, energy generation, in terms of its cost, um, and in terms of its capacity to provide uh, in industrial nations, you know, at a consumer level and an industrial level. China actually built, I was listening to uh, Tim Buckley from Climate Energy Finance a couple of months ago, really great speaker, and uh, his data shows that China um, has actually made six times more in solar power capacity um, in the last year in terms of energy generation capacity than Australia has ever created in its entire life, in its entire existence as a country, um, with all, all you know, measures of energy generation, coal, gas, hydro, wind, solar, the whole lot. Six times more in one year in solar alone, right? So while China may be building more thermal coal um, plants or digging up domestic sources of coal, they're supercharging the renewables industry. And so if we're not getting on top of that as an economy, we're going to be left behind. And um, this is not secret data. The government knows this. The only justification for more investment in the coal export market is state capture, as far as I can tell. Um, the interests of these coal corporations being prioritised over the national interests of all Australians and, you know, the global interests of all people that exist in the world, right? Um, and it's an absolute disgrace. So, um, as many of your listeners may know, that uh, that announcement was released to close of business on, on Tuesday, as you said, the, the 25th. Um, on Wednesday morning in Newcastle, Rising Tide Comrades stopped a coal train at Sandgate in protest um, with about 12 hours notice and 12 hours prep time, including sleep. Um, so I'm happy to talk more about that, but uh, that was our response. Um, and it will be you know, followed up by further actions, including in November at the world's uh, people's blockade of the world's largest coal port. Yeah, uh, thanks so much, Zach. We'll definitely uh, talk a little bit more about the the actions and the and the upcoming things that are happening as well in a second. Um, and you kind of uh, touched on this a little bit, but you know, as you're saying, there's this pretty much urgent need to address and combat climate change. It's not really this far flung future threat anymore. It's already having a massive impact. Um, I mean, I was just looking at like th this year in climate disasters uh, before this, and there's. So many things, uh, heat waves, uh, massive floods in, in across uh, various countries, fires and cyclones. Um, even just this week, there's the uh, uh, Hurricane Helene in the United States has killed more than 120 people. Um, so it's not just affecting, you know, poorer countries, but, um, you know, the, the US as well. And that's, you know, an unprecedented storm caused by climate change and global heating. Um, so there's all these, you know, t pretty terrifying facts and statistics that uh, people are aware of, uh, and you've, you kind of touched on this already. But why why does Labor refuse to take any any action to actually address, um, you know, the climate emergency? So I'm not a political analyst. Um, I'm an agitator, um, but as an agitator, uh, my gut tells me that it's a combination of fear, uh, greed, and cowardice, and that comes from a lot of different pressures, right? Um, some people, I'm sure, do go into the Labor Party to try and make the world a better place. Um, however, it remains the fact that the fossil fuel industry um, is deeply entrenched uh, at all levels of, you know, Australian politics. Um, whether that's the revolving door of, you know, job offers for fossil fuel companies or corporate lobbyists for uh, exiting parliamentarians, Labor parliamentarians take those offers up quite a lot. Um, or direct donations to the parties. Labor takes just as much, if not in some cases more, than the coalition from um, the fossil fuel industry. And that's the money um, now of. <laughs> um, our, our disclosure laws for political donations are, um, in terms of the rest of the world, quite poor. Um, so there's the direct pressure from the industry to, you know, support their interests, their corporate interests, not workers' interests, but corporate interests um, above all else. Uh, there's also, you know, the, the fear 
um, that some people in the Labor Party have about the um, campaigns that could be waged against them if they actually took a proper stand. And you need to look at what happened to Kevin Rudd um, when he proposed the you know, mining super profits tax back in his tenure, the um, uh, militant response by the Daily Telegraph and Murdoch Media and um, you know, bandwagoned on by coalition. Um, they fear the reprisals um, in the media and that might filter down electorally um, by the industry, but, but they don't have the, um, uh, the courage, I suppose, to build the social movement power to actually combat that at a grassroots level, right? They're, they're happy to um, advance corporate interests when it seems like the easy thing for them to do. Um, they're not so happy to build grassroots power to combat corporate interests so they have the political capital to do what's actually required of them and take care of you know, the everyday punter. So, so um, I'm not a parliamentarian, thank God. Um, I hope I never become one, but, but it is their job to not just be um, you know, uh, technocrats or bureaucrats or seat warmers. It really should be their job to be organisers and use the platform that they have to, to build strong and deep connections uh, with, you know, social movements and with civil society, as, as they have done in the past. Um, and the trade union movement, you know, once was um, much stronger than it is now. Um, and it has been sequentially weakened by uh, legislation from within the Labor Party. Um, uh, I wouldn't say that it's a lost cause, but it's, a, it's an area of contest that needs to be reawakened. Um, very, very strongly. And of course, um, people have tried and failed within the party before. So my area of contest that I've nominated <laughs> is well without, well without the party system. Um, we're taking direct action against the companies. Yeah, nice. And yeah, um, definitely, as you said, it requires this kind of grassroots movement and uh, I'm, I'm just trying to imagine a, a world where all the parliamentarians <laughs> were organizers. That would be amazing. Um, but that kind of leads to my next question, which was about how, you know, how we can build up that uh, popular uh, power for the action to, to, to combat, you know, the pressures of uh, the big fossil fuel companies and the media that's uh, supporting them. Um, I guess uh, this involves, you know, the direct actions that y you mentioned, that the train uh, blocking the coal train, the upcoming uh, blockade of the coal port, as well as, you know, there's a lot of protests outside MPs, offices and stuff uh, when the announcement was made last week. Um, so I guess kind of two, two sides of this is um, how can, you know, how can these various activities contribute to building that power to take, to force uh, governments to take action? And what kind of, uh, would you like, what would you, would you like governments to actually do? Uh, it, uh, what kind of things would, would are you, uh, arguing for, uh, basically, what actions would you like to see them to take? Sure. Well, look, rising tides demands, um, as a movement, are pretty simple. Um, one is uh, no new coal or gas expansions, uh, certainly cancelling the ones that have been approved but not yet begun. Um, there are no jobs in mines that don't exist. You're not protecting <laughs> jobs if, if you're opening mines that, that don't exist. Um, uh, so you know, step one is to stop pouring fuel on the fire, stop making the problem worse, you bastards. Um, point number two for us is, is one that I'm really proud of, actually, and it's the imposition of um, a, we're calling for a 75% tax on fossil fuel export profits, um, which is actually commensurate with Norway. Norway taxes its oil exports at 78% through a combined number of mechanisms, but, but ultimately the citizens of Norway uh, regain 78% of the profits made on their oil exports. Um, and in our case, that should be to fund transition and also to fund um, you know, climate loss and damage both at home and, and abroad because we are the world's second largest fossil fuel exporter. And yet the taxes that we put on our export industries are among some of the world's lowest, uh, which is... Um, a remarkable abdication of responsibility by, by our government. Um, in New South Wales, coal royalties average about 8 to 12%, which, you know, sounds like a lot when they, when they talk about how many number of billions that they paid over a course of a year. 
but obviously is, you know, far, far less than the everyday Australian pays on their income tax, proportionally. Um, and these are corporations that, that, you know, whether they're held in Australia or overseas, you know, that money goes into private pockets. Um, uh, whereas in Norway, you know, the 78% of their oil exports goes into a sovereign wealth fund that's worth um, over two, Aus, two trillion Australian dollars at this point. And, and they basically run their social services off the interest of that fund. Um, if you divvied it up between each Norwegian citizen, people are getting over a million dollars each. Um, and, and we could be doing that. You know, Australia is one of the wealthiest countries in the world. We can do anything that we put our mind to. We just can't do everything, right? And um, we can't uh, keep, you know, giving... So, so we, we give uh, the coal and gas industry... Last year, we gave them directly over $14 billion of taxpayer money to subsidise their industry because um, it's actually less profitable than they would like. Um, uh, and we've also given them about $70 billion in tax breaks, right? Um, that's in addition to the almost no tax that they pay on the offset. So we can't do that and also fund a transition. We can't do that and also take care of people with, you know, dental and Medicare and fund our schools adequately and give our nurses a pay rise, you know. We, we can't keep preferencing corporate interests over the lives of everyday Australians. Um, uh, not even going to touch on the AUKUS deal or the Stage 3 tax mm. cuts or any of the other terrible decisions that have been made. Um, because there's always money for terrible decisions that preference corporate interests. There's always money for terrible decisions that, you know, support the military-industrial complex or a tenuous alliance with the US. But there's never enough money for doing things that the government's actually meant to do, right? Um, so, look, those are, the, those are the core demands at the moment. But what we're looking for, so being no new coal and gas and this 75% export tax, um, but ultimately we're looking to end coal exports, actually all fossil fuel exports from Australia by 2030, because that's what the science says. And that's what the science has said for decades, right? And it's time to call a spade a spade. Enough is enough. Um, this is not an impossible task. It is possible. It is very possible. China has shown us it's possible because they're doing it. Um, but again, we can't do it while giving the companies that are destroying the world billions of taxpayer money, right? So, so that's what we're calling for. And the way that we hope to achieve that is by actually building power. Um, and protests... Um, are amazing things. I think they're really, really important. They're a critical part of democracy, right? That's how I've gotten involved in politics is, is through protest. But protests alone don't actually build power. Um, they are a really critical part of inspiring people to step up, take, take a stand in public life, you know, um, actually express um, your feelings in a public space, become part of civil society, right? But unless they either threaten an electoral um, result and and threaten to actually materially you know kick a party out of power or a politician out of power or they disrupt an industry or you know the state of the world the status quo as it is materially by say stopping a coal train or, or a coal port they don't themselves hold power they're an indicator of momentum they're an indicator of popular support and so what we want to do is knowing that um, you know, the vast majority of Australians actually support more money for transition. They support high taxes for fossil fuel, support high taxes for all corporations, really. Um, and they support greater action on climate is to try and translate that energy and that passion towards a form of protest that has power. Um, and so I'm not going to make, uh, you know, claims that us stopping a coal train uh, once is necessarily an indication of that power. Um, a company can wear, you know, two, three, four hours of a delay. It will cost them some money. It will embarrass the government somewhat, but it won't stop the industry, right? But imagine if we could do that, you know, for weeks or months or indefinitely. Um, that is power. That is the power to change the world as it is. Um, and that is what events like the blockade aspire to give a taste of, I suppose. We're looking at stopping coal ships out of the world's largest coal port for 50 hours um, at least. And 
that is a significant material escalation from last year where we, we did stop coal ships for 32 hours on the water. Right? It's growing the capacity of the community to take the action that is required to actually shut down the industry that's destroying us all. Um, and there are examples of this across recent Australian history, including the Bentley blockade up in the Northern Rivers, uh, I believe 2014, um, as part of the Lock the Gate anti-coal seam gas campaigns. Now, there were a lot of campaigns um, around that area, and many of them lost. Um, uh, it's a hard gig, and, you know, um, people who, who hold the line are, are absolute heroes, in my opinion. But at a town called Bentley, the community actually mustered uh, an on-site blockade of the site that was earmarked for a fracking rig. Um, and they worked the relationships, they worked the community, they talked to people and convinced people that this was a strategy that could win. And when people think they can actually win, they're much more likely to get involved. Um, and then they put 5,000 people on the entrance to the site. And there's not much you can do against 5,000 people. And the New South Wales government tried, right? They mustered about 900-something cops um, from Sydney, from Newcastle, all the way up the north coast. Um, the you know uh, the the caterers wouldn't serve them the you know motel owners wouldn't house them uh, they asked the rural fire service to use their headquarters as a base of operation the rural fire service said get fucked um, and so they're already facing logistical issues because the people didn't want them there the people wanted the protest to succeed um, so they're already facing logistical issues then they get on site and see five thousand community members not you know black clad anarchists or radicals that they can very easily, you know, escalate against. And I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with black clad anarchists and radicals. I love them to bits. But, but they get on site and they see grandmothers and farmers, you know, the doctor who works in the corner store um, in the local pub or whatever. Um, and, and those 5,000 people become politically unpoliceable. Um, I say politically unpoliceable because theoretically, you know, the cops could break out the big guns and, and start cracking heads. Um, and in some countries, they do. Um, we are very lucky, I think, that we live in a country where that does not yet happen to that scale in that way. Although, um, seeing what's happened in Melbourne uh, with the, with the um, land forces disruption, you, you can see examples of that starting to happen. But when, when 5,000 community members, rather than you know, radicals, are there, there's not much you can do. So the police union um, basically took one look at the situation and said, can't do it, won't do it. Um, it had ceased to be a policing problem and it became a political problem, which required a political solution. And at the end of the day, the mining license for that site was actually cancelled. Um, now, that's one example. Um, and that's also an example of a site where the industry hadn't got its foothold in, which is very different to Newcastle Port. Um, but... It is an example of what mass disruptive protest can actually do. It, it can get the goods. And, and the key to me is to turn a policing problem into a political problem. And that's what we're aiming to do with our mass numbers. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Um, and I like that example. And hopefully people can take a lot away from that um, and obviously look more into it if, if you want. Um, I just, uh, I liked how you talked about, uh, you know, I think some some uh, activists can go, you know, there's this dichotomy, you're either into, you know, big protests, or you're into, you know, one person locking themselves onto a, uh, you know, uh, some kind of infrastructure and causing disruption, and those two are diametrically opposed. Whereas I think this approach that Rising Tide is going for, has kind of got the best of both worlds, where it is, you know, uh, causing real disruption to, you know, the coal port and all the companies that are trying to send their ships through. Um, but also it's able to bring in like big numbers of people. Um, I know it was a few thousand last year and I think you're aiming for 10,000 this year. Um, and for the people who weren't at the blockade last year, uh, I was lucky to, enough to go. It was this really great environment where there's, there's families playing on the beach, getting out on the kayaks. Um, I know there was like a, a 90 something year old was arrested. Um, so it was this whole like uh, community wide um, activity and, and uh, really brought lots of people in as opposed to, you know, just a small group who were able to, you know, sacrifice uh, income or, uh, you know, w willing to spend time in jail or whatever 
and those people are obviously really important in in a lot of movements but to able to have the whole spectrum of, of society all together for one cause was a, a really powerful thing um i also just wanted to mention you talked about you know we can block you know a coal train for a few hours we can uh even a few days or whatever and that's that's one thing but the aim is this kind of longevity and having a, a long-term impact and i think an example of that we've seen this year is how effective the Palestine solidarity camps at the universities have been. Now, a lot of people say, you know, they didn't actually, they haven't achieved their full goals of all the universities divesting from Israel, etc. But, you know, a few a few months of, of camping out on their campus and they've got, you know, disclosure agreements, put all this pressure. There actually has been some, some quite significant wins from that. And I think, you know, there's a lot of refugee encampments happening now. That are a similar uh, similar attempt, and a lot of the successful climate protests in the past few decades have been, you know, people camping out at uh, these mining sites, etc., and that's had quite an effect. So, you know, uh, for anyone who didn't make it to last year's uh, people's blockade uh, in Newcastle, definitely um, check it out. I mean, we've got a lot of there's a lot of photos and videos online that show how kind of uh, great it was. Um, so, but this year's it's coming up quickly. Um, it's uh, end of November. So, there's been uh, Rising Tides organising a lot of kind of events in the lead up to the blockade, and uh, obviously it's happening towards the end of November. So, for people who want to get involved or want to hear more about it, could you tell them a bit about this year's blockade? Yeah, absolutely. So, so it's a big thing this year's blockade. Last year was. Um, 32 hours on water, well, 30 hours approved and two hours extra. Um, where, yeah, as you referenced, 109 people stayed out in the water, myself included, uh, ended up arrested by the police, including, yeah, 97 year old um, Uniting Church Reverend Alan Stewart, not one of the usual suspects, as you might say. Um, and yeah, this year is, is not only a 50 hour uh, blockade on water, but it's actually a 10 day long mobilization. Um, which is a severe escalation for us. So the blockade, um, sort of the, the mobilisation starts on the 19th in Newcastle, which is a Tuesday, 19th of November, um, and goes until the 28th. Um, the 26th, 27th and 28th, the final three days, uh, which is also a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, will actually happen in Canberra. Those are the final three sitting days of Parliament. Um, and after completing our unprecedented on-water blockade of the world's largest coal port, we'll be taking that momentum straight, straight to the parliament to, to basically, you know, in, in slightly nicer words than this, say, look at what we can do, get your shit together. Um, because that's what this blockade is about, right? It's about demonstrating the momentum that we have in the community, um, the depth of commitment, the depth of the relationships that we've built over the last year. Um, and, and that story of community momentum is, I think, more empowering and impactful than anything else that we could say. Um, because we are hoping to build the power to disrupt the industry, you know, on an ongoing basis. That is our explicit stated goal. But you can't do it overnight. And you can't do it at scale without building the skills and relationships um, and, and setting some precedent of what that actually might look like. So... For those of you who are interested in the project, um, I would encourage everyone to register for the blockade. The, the earlier you do it, the easier it is on us organisers. Um, but what, what it's going to look like is for these three days before, before Friday, so Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, the 19th to 21st, we're actually going to be building uh, not only the camp infrastructure um, on, you know, on the beach, but we're going to be building the skills and connections between us as a movement. So we're looking at workshops, um, you know, nonviolent direct action trainings, strategy trainings. Uh, Wednesday night, we're hosting a just transition seminar um, with union speakers, um, a whole bunch of sort of, you know, community activities because what I've learned in my, um, it's only really been two years as, as an organizer um, uh, is that relationships are critical, right? Um, it's actually the joy that we find in, in, you know, treating each other as full humans, and political agents, you know, people who have the chance to, to make some change in the world that holds the movement together. So that's those first three days is building, building the skills and relationships 
And then Friday, Saturday, Sunday, that's, that's the sexy part. That's getting out on the water. Uh, we've, got, we've bought um, 150 inflatable two-person kayaks. Um, I can fit 17 of the ba- in the back of my car. Um, so they're a logistician's uh, godsend. Um, but we've got, you know, we've got all of the kayaks that we had last year, uh, pontoons. Um, I think I can say that the Greenpeace uh, vessel Oceania is coming um, with a pretty large international Greenpeace boat team. Um, uh, we've got amazing acts, including Angie McMahon, um, John Butler, uh, Dobby, uh, the rapper. Uh, I think Peter Garrett's going to p- play a set. Um, so it's, it's, you know, it's pumping um, over the weekend. It's going to be the best party that you've attended all year. Certainly the best party that I've attended all year. Um, <laughs> uh, not to speak for anyone. But that's, that's Friday to Sunday. And then Monday is um, a day off. Uh, well, actually, it's not at all a day off. Um, we'll all be working very hard, but but one of the things we get to look at is what happens next, right? Rising tide. We've got some plans in the in the works that we'll be sharing with attendees, but it's also a moment for the movement, right, to take stock and um, uh, assess what's happened over the weekend, um, make plans for Canberra, but also make plans for 2025. So there's a lot of um, really critical, um, inspiring work that's going to happen over that weekend, and then it's off to Canberra. Um, like I said, to send the message really, really clearly. So my message to you would be um, come to the blockade, register now, but you can also join your local Rising Tide group, right? We've got um, pretty established hubs in uh, Brisbane, the Northern Rivers, uh, Newcastle, Sydney, Canberra, uh, Melbourne, Central Victoria has got a pretty um, decentralised network. Blue Mountains is just starting up. Um, Adelaide is going strong. And there are, there are other um, groups of sort of you know, slightly less organisation popping up all all around the place. So I've been in touch with people from Wollongong, from yeah, Urubadala down on the south coast. Um, uh, this movement is growing really quickly. And again, it's about the relationships and it's about how we treat each other. Um, one of the reasons I'm so um, privileged, I think, to be part of this, this group is because um, uh, of the hope that it inspires in people and people who are inspired by hope um, uh, and you know the joy that they find in the community want to propagate that hope, want to propagate that joy, um, and it's just such a such an inspiring um, group of people to be around. It really has made my life so much better. So, so that's the call out. Um, you can find the contact information of these groups on our website, risingtide.org.au. Um, but also just have a dig around in your networks and your movement and. Um, if you can't find anyone around you who's who's interested in getting involved, um, you know, reach out to us. And we can try and put you in touch with folks in your area. Yeah, awesome. I don't think anyone could turn down that. Sounds sounds like it's going to be amazing. And like you said, the best party of the year as well. And it's rare that you get to kind of combine party and protest. Um, and I think it makes it all uh, a lot better. So, yeah, as, uh, as Zach said, check out the Rising Tide website, risingtide.org.au. We'll put a link in the description on this as well. And, yeah, check out uh, any of the local groups that are near you. And if there's not one, I'm sure you can f- uh, start forming your own. Um, I think it's going to be, you know, a really inspiring uh, event. And, uh, yeah, can't wait to see kind of where things go in the future. Uh, is there anything else that you wanted to mention before we wrap up? Well, I, I do just want to emphasize one last thing. And, and you know, some people ask me um, why, you know, it's, it's worth getting involved. Um, because, you know, even though I think we've got a pretty, we've got a pretty good plan, <laughs> otherwise I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't be investing my life into it. But, you know, even if, even if what we're going to be doing, this disruptive protest thing, even if it doesn't work or it doesn't have the impact that you think it will, and I think it will, but if, even if you don't, um, the, the, the joy and the community aspect of this movement um, is, is going to be so uh, important in whatever is to come, I think. You know, no matter if you think we're, we're all you know, going straight to hell um, or whether you think there's some hope left in the world, uh, you want to be with people who have an experience of organising um, uh, you know, amazing events like these, building relationships um, diplomatically, strategically, with connection and care. Um, you want to be, if we're going straight into hell, these are the people I want to be going into hell with, right? Like, um, 
uh, there's no there's no version of the world, as far as I can see it, um, where investing in this sort of project doesn't make your life and the world a better place. Um, and it, you know, unfortunately, we're not. You know, well, fortunately, <laughs> we're not an NGO. Um, we we don't have uh, mass funding. We can't promise um, a professional um, anything really. This is just <laughs> the people doing stuff, right? Um, but yeah, building relationships with people who care about the world and care about the future um, is is possibly the best thing that has happened in my life. Um, and I can only imagine, uh, and I hope that it is the same for others. So so please do join us either in Rising Tide or across the movement. Um, there's no one right way of doing things, but um, uh, we're very, very privileged to play a part in, in the movement for change. Amazing. Very well put. Um, thanks so much, Zach, for your time today. Thank you, Isaac. And that's about all we've got time for on this episode of the Green Left News Podcast. Uh, you can check out any of the uh, things we mentioned in the description down below. Um, please, as I said at the start, share this with your friends, like, comment, uh, leave a rating. Uh, and if you'd like to help us out uh, financially, you can become a supporter at greenleft.org.au forward slash support. Plans start from $5 a month and it makes a huge difference to help us continue this project, but also everything that Green Left does. Uh, and uh, I'd like to also thank uh, Sean uh, Valenzuela or at Little Archer Beats for the music that you've heard in this podcast. Um, and uh, make sure to attend the Palestine 12 Months of Genocide rallies this weekend and Standing with Lebanon as well. And also uh, check out the risingtide.org.au to find out more about the upcoming People's Blockade. Uh, and we'll see you next week on the podcast. Thank you. Thank you.